We continue our exploration of George Gilder's Life After Capitalism, and this is the fourth part of our interpretation. In the previous sections, we established that wealth is knowledge and growth is learning. However, knowledge needs to be created, and in Gilder's context, learning isn't about replicating existing answers but about companies and consumers collectively learning new applications and methods through practical experience. According to Gilder, the key to economics is the creation of knowledge. Understanding this fundamental concept is crucial for comprehending the role of entrepreneurs and the relationship between government and businesses. How is knowledge created? If one were to say that the iPhone was invented by Steve Jobs, it would be unfair, as the iPhone is the result of collaboration among countless engineers at Apple. However, the engineers developed the iPhone because Jobs first imagined it, set various requirements, and shaped its form. Moreover, the crucial aspect is whether the iPhone product is truly viable in the market, whether all the prior development efforts were worthwhile, and whether the risks involved must be borne by Jobs rather than any individual engineer. If you agree that true knowledge isn't the free formulas found in textbooks but rather the understanding of what something must be like to be successful in the market, then you must acknowledge that this kind of knowledge is created by entrepreneurs. Yet, creativity is challenging to observe. What people often observe is incentive. Why does someone undertake a particular venture? Ah, because it can make money. Entrepreneurs are often viewed as arbitrageurs. Seizing opportunities where a product is cheaper in market A and more expensive in market B. However, arbitrage cannot explain the creation of Apple products by Jobs, electric cars and rockets by Elon Musk or AI by Sam Altman. Before these entrepreneurs entered the scene, these things had no market. They created the market. Why not mention Ford? Cars were not initially a market demand. If you asked consumers what they wanted, they would tell you they wanted a faster horse. Entrepreneurs don't spend all day using big data to find opportunities. They create opportunities. Gilder argues that the creativity of entrepreneurs is not driven by greed but by imagination. He believes that the existing supply-demand dynamics in the market cannot fully explain the creativity of entrepreneurs. Creativity must originate from outside the system, from higher cognitive imagination injected into the market. This involves some philosophical thinking. Gilder references Gödel's incompleteness theorems and computer science pioneers Turing and von Neumann. His argument is not impeccably rigorous but has a certain logic. The core idea is that a system's internal elements randomly fiddling around won't produce anything advanced. Instead, someone from outside the system must input advanced thinking, what Gilder calls oracles for good things to develop. Entrepreneurs are the outputters of these oracles. While this assertion may be contentious, it is the crucial insight in Gilder's thinking that one must take seriously. The role of entrepreneurs is not merely, or even primarily, to make markets more efficient by exploiting opportunities but to, more importantly, create things in the market that do not exist by outputting oracles. Before Musk ventured into rockets, rockets were considered the domain of national institutions like NASA, not something for private companies to contemplate. It was Musk's desire to expedite human travel to Mars that led him to build rockets from first principles. Before GPT-3 came out, even experts in AI generally didn't think large language models were a promising direction, but Sam Altman believed in it because he had to develop general artificial intelligence to fulfill his ambition of systematically changing the world. Why did Mark Benioff establish Salesforce.com? How did he conceive of creating cloud-based customer relationship management software? Because he had a dream. These stories are legendary now, but the essence is that entrepreneurs make decisions not based solely on science and rationality, not the decision-making seen in economics and management studies but based on intuition and imagination. In his book, Rethinking Entrepreneurial Spirit, Mr. Zhang Weiying recounts an instance where Zhou Hongyi of Kihu 360 reviewed a business plan for a young entrepreneur and said the idea wouldn't work. 
Zhang Weiying pointed out that, just because Zhou Hongyi said it wouldn't work, doesn't mean it won't, as people also said the same about Zhou Hongyi when he started his business. Zhou Hongyi also mentioned, since starting my own business, every decision I've made has not been well received by others. Certainly, concrete actions require science and rationality, but here, I understand the role of entrepreneurs as initiating a vision from outside the normal operation a task that Wolfram calls the highest level job for humans, discovering new possibilities. This decision making is more art than technology. Why can entrepreneurs do this? Because, in addition to the general risks with known probabilities, risk, there is also the uncertainty brought by new things, experiences without precedent, unquantifiable, Knightian uncertainty, as we discussed earlier. The entrepreneur's task is not to adapt to risk but to create uncertainty. Not to assess the current probabilities of various possibilities, but to disrupt the current situation and introduce an X factor. Thus, in Gilder's view, entrepreneurs are not just individuals who go wherever there is an opportunity to make money. If opportunities could be digitized, AI wouldn't even be necessary. You could write a computer program to automatically discover price differences. Gilder's entrepreneurs are individuals who create their opportunities because they have a visionary imagination. The oracles they output cannot be predicted by any model and are irreducible. Gilder believes entrepreneurs have three characteristics. 1. They must pursue specificity, detesting mediocrity. 2. They cannot discover new things from old places. They cannot ensure the future path by examining the current scenery. Data and experience may be helpful, but they cannot provide safety. 3. Regardless of how much preparation you make, there will eventually be a moment when you act regardless of preparation. True surprises occur at that moment, and that moment is driven by your beliefs. Entrepreneurs must be both dreamers and pragmatists. Furthermore, to get others to work with you, you must convince them to embrace your dream, which is essentially the art of persuasion. Zhang Weiying says, entrepreneurs need the ability to turn imagined things into reality. They need the ability to change others' beliefs and persuade others to do what they want. This is also what Steve Jobs called the reality distortion field. Entrepreneurs live in a distorted reality, which is why they can distort reality. The degree of distortion depends on how surprising the thing you create makes people feel. We previously discussed Claude Shannon's information theory, and Shannon's crucial insight was that the size of the information in something depends on how much uncertainty it overcomes, in other words, information is surprise. If you spend money on an investment class, and the lecturer talks for three hours but only discusses well-known opportunities on the street, then you know the class was a waste. Everyone knows that it's an opportunity, so it's not an opportunity because either it can't be implemented, or its arbitrage space under competition is already very small. What you want is the kind of unexpected news that nobody thought could make money, but it did. Markets love surprises. In the stock market, the more unexpected the news, the greater the volatility. The truly valuable things are the unexpected ones. This rule aligns perfectly with the principles of scientific discovery. Philosopher of science Karl Popper realized early on that, scientific discovery is not a step-by-step -step process, where you continue forward in the direction of Newtonian mechanics to reach relativity it doesn't work that way. Relativity overturned Newtonian mechanics, and for physicists of that generation, relativity was a huge surprise. Popper proposed that the significance of scientific progress should be determined by the degree of surprise. Aren't entrepreneurs the same? The most valuable entrepreneurial companies are those that can create surprises. They are doing zero to one things. Yes, you can make money going from one to n, but that's hard-earned money because if others see it and everyone sees it, you must engage in price wars without any surprises. Engaging in price wars won't lead to developed countries. China needs a large number of creators of new ecological niches, people who can create surprises. And people like that don't randomly appear.
Gilder lists some lessons from the practical operations of entrepreneurs. Two key points stand out. First is, it's the person that makes things happen. We often talk about how things shape people, but Gilder believes that individuals are paramount. He cites the example of China's semiconductor industry. The Chinese government initiated a massive fund to promote domestic semiconductors, spreading money liberally. What's wrong with this approach? Isn't venture capital about casting a wide net? If I invest in many companies, even if only one becomes successful, wouldn't that be enough? Gilder argues that the fundamental reason this approach is unsuccessful is that entrepreneurs do more than just trial and error. You need real ideas to take risks valuable imagination doesn't fall from the sky. Examining the entrepreneurial history of Silicon Valley, from the earliest Fairchild Semiconductor to the traitorous eight, to companies like Intel, it wasn't a matter of just picking a hundred graduates from prestigious universities to develop Silicon Valley. Those entrepreneurs not only had a deep technical foundation but were also thinkers, possessing their own work philosophies. They were genuinely engaged in invention and creation, not just reckless spending. In other words, you need significant figures first before you can have Silicon Valley. If the environment only nurtures examiners and arbitrageurs, no matter how much money you invest, you won't produce great companies. So, the innovation of entrepreneurs isn't a random act but involves having people first and then events. Wisdom comes before enterprises, and this is not gambling. The second lesson is that, entrepreneurs are learners. Not rote learners but continuous learners. Your teacher is the market. You may have a great idea for a new product, but its actual success is determined by the market. Regardless of whether you start with a minimum viable product or reveal a big move all at once, you are validating it by presenting real money in the market. This is akin to Karl Popper's idea of falsifiability for scientific theories no matter how elegant a theory is, it's useless until you conduct an experiment. The market serves as the best laboratory. For scientists, experiment failure is entirely normal. It just means that the hypothesis didn't meet expectations. It's a valuable knowledge t o oh, no something doesn't work. Investing is not gambling. It's learning. Gilder states that the most formidable venture capitalists, such as those managing private equity funds in the United States, are the most knowledgeable people. These individuals are learning every day, have a profound understanding of the industry, and many of them are engineers who spent decades in the industry before transitioning to investment. From the perspective that, wealth is knowledge and growth is learning, every action of an entrepreneur is an experiment. When they generate ideas, they are artists. When they realize ideas, they are engineers. When they verify ideas, they are scientists. They are bold but also careful, eagerly awaiting the results of the experiment. What's more impressive is that, many times, they are spending their own money on these experiments, sometimes even using investor money but they are genuinely spending money, not just talking on paper. You can imagine how valuable this kind of knowledge is. And the government's role is not to disrupt their experiments. That concludes this part. In the next section, we will discuss the stage of low entropy. If you feel there is value in this, please like, subscribe to this channel, and leave your thoughts or suggestions in the comments section. Let's grow together and read more good books.